Hello, Bring Back the Salmon viewers, and welcome to week four of our Classroom Hatchery program. I'm your host, Ben Teske, from the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. Now, this week, we're going to start off with a little bit of fish information from my son, Leaf. Will you go fish? Take your money. And go wiggle bank. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that joke. Leaf tells it way better than I do. So Leaf is my son, and he's four years old. I remember back in the summer of 2015, my wife and I went to a clinic where a midwife used this special tool to listen on my wife's belly for the growing fetus inside of her. At this point, my wife showed no visible signs of being pregnant. So the midwife is using this tool, and we could hear my wife's heartbeat. Ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. Ba-boom, ba-boom. And then all of a sudden, we could hear this fainter and much quicker second heartbeat. Ba-boom, 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 ba-boom. Now at this point in time, Leaf was only about the size of a sweet pea. Just about the same size as our Atlantic salmon eggs. But he had already done lots of growing and developing. See, like our fish, Leaf started out as a fertilized egg. But unlike our fish, he started to develop into a fetus inside of his mother. A month or so later, we went back to the clinic, and this time we got an ultrasound picture of Leaf. He was now about the size of a big juicy raspberry. He continued to grow and develop, and then was born as a baby in March of 2016. From a baby, he grew and developed into a toddler and then into the kind, cool, and funny child he is today. In a decade or so, he'll be a teenager. Then he'll be an adult. If everything goes right, eventually he'll be an old man. Along the way, he may also have a child or children of his own. These stages, fetus, baby, Child, teenager, adult, these are all the stages of the human life cycle. I was once a fetus. I was once a baby, just like all of you were. Just like my parents have gone through all of the stages of the human life cycle, and their parents before them did that as well. In fact, we're all the products of all of the life cycles that happened before us. Every living thing has a life cycle. An oak tree might have a very different looking life cycle than we do, but it still has a life cycle. It starts out as an acorn. Then it becomes a seedling, and then a sapling, and then a mature oak tree. So in every acorn, there's the potential for a huge, old, mighty oak. Life is an amazing process. It's a miracle. Try this. When you wake up in the morning, as soon as your eyes open up, before you do anything else, think about all the life cycles that have happened for you to even exist and how much growth and development you've already achieved. Try this for a week. If you're anything like me, you'll begin every single day being thankful for the life that you've been given. This week, we're gonna be learning about the life cycle of Atlantic salmon from Ashley Smith from Ontario Streams. But before we hear from Ashley, let's check on our hatchery units. Okay, so we will start with this tank, the one that we're calling the lake tank. We're not calling it the lake tank because we're mimicking the lake environment. These eggs would all in the wild be laid in a cold water stream. We're calling it a lake tank, the lake tank because of the picture we've got on the front. That's the only reason why we're calling this one the lake tank. So we'll make sure it's working properly. There's our filter. Nice flow of water going through there. We've got the bubbles coming up from the aerator, coming out of the air stone, adding oxygen to the water. And then we want to make sure our chiller is working properly. And the easiest way to do that is to just check the temperature. If the chiller's not working properly, the temperature won't be correct. 
and we can see on the thermometer here that red line in the middle that indicates the temperature and we can see the zero on the left hand side and each little mark along there is one degree Celsius so we're sitting at six degrees now we wanted this tank at seven but six is perfectly fine because the way, the way this chiller works is if we set it for seven, it'll, the temperature will vary from five or six degrees to up to about eight degrees. But it's gonna average around seven. So that's, that's good. Then we'll check our eggs. And they're looking really good. We can see that these fish are developing. Remember those dots inside are the eyes. And I don't know how well you can see, but I can see more and more of the fish developing. We've got one dead egg there. That's okay. We're gonna lose some, that's inevitable. So the lake tank is looking great. All right, so now for the river tank. Again, nice flow of water coming through the filter. The bubbles coming up from the aerator. And this one we wanted to have the temperature sitting right about four degrees and we're sitting at five, five degrees Celsius. Again, that's fine. We're looking for an average of four, so it's gonna vary from three to five, approximately. And here's our eggs. Also looking quite healthy. Excellent, both hatcheries are in good shape. So let's learn about life cycles from Ashley. Hi everyone, hope you've been enjoying all of the episodes so far as part of the Classroom Hatchery Programs webinar series. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the Atlantic Salmon Life Cycle. And just to start, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Ashley. I'm a project biologist, which means that it's my job to create and implement stream habitat restoration projects throughout the greater Toronto area, uh, specifically in the Lake Ontario watershed. I work for an environmental charity called Ontario Streams, and we host five classroom hatchery tanks throughout Peel region, which is part of the greater Toronto area. And our goal is to restore and enhance stream and wetland habitat in Ontario where sensitive aquatic species live, like the Atlantic salmon that you've heard so much about over the last couple of weeks. So what is an Atlantic salmon? An Atlantic salmon is a native salmonid species to Ontario. Salmonid is just another word for salmon, and that means that they've always lived in Ontario, they haven't been introduced. They were once commonly found in Lake Ontario, but are now extirpated, which means that they are locally extinct. So you can still find Atlantic salmon throughout the world. You might even see them at the grocery store, so they're not entirely extinct, but the Lake Ontario population is extinct. So Atlantic salmon vanished from Lake Ontario in the late 19th century, and this was due to overfishing, habitat loss, and the installation of dams and other barriers to spawning movement. They're anadromous, which means that they live in the streams and the lakes, and they transition between the two different habitats throughout their lives. And where do Atlantic salmon live? Well, they live in streams, lakes, and or oceans. So like I mentioned, the other populations live all over the world, some of them in Nova Scotia, for example, so they would leave the streams and go into the ocean. The population that we're talking about today will just be living in fresh water, so just Lake Ontario and the headwater streams. They require cold, clean, free-flowing streams to live and spawn in. 
And when they're living in streams, they're in three different stages, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about those later. But first, just as a little bit of an overview, they start as eggs, they move into the alevin stage, and then into the fry stage. They undergo smoltification, which means that they're getting ready to move into the lake habitat, and then they're adults. And this is when they're living in Lake Ontario until they decide to go back to the streams. Like I mentioned, they're anadromous, so they go back to the streams later to have their eggs. What is a life cycle? A life cycle is a series of changes that an organism or a living thing undergoes throughout its life, returning back to the starting state. So as you can see in this little diagram here, starting from one through five, those are all of the different stages that an organism might go through. And in terms of the Atlantic salmon life cycle, it would look something like this. So they start as eggs that are laid by adults. They hatch into the alevin stage. They lose their yolk sacs and they turn into the fry stage. Then they enter the par stage, the smolt stage, and then finally the adult stage where they go on to lay eggs of their own. So it's just kind of this circular process, which is the life cycle that they undergo. And just to give you a visual of what that looks like, you can see here, starting at the top left, they begin as eggs. This is the alevin with the yolk sac. This is the fry stage where they no longer have a yolk sac. This is the par stage, and you can see these are the lateral par marks that we've talked about already. Then they undergo a big change and they go through smoltification. And you can see here that they no longer have those dark lines. They are a blue-gray color as they're trying to transition into uh, a better uh, color to live in lake habitat, which will help them blend in with lakes more than streams. They get quite a bit bigger into the adult stage when they're living in Lake Ontario. And then when they're ready, they go back up the streams to where they were born and they have eggs of their own. And they just continue through that process. So first, as eyed eggs, a female Atlantic salmon can lay between 400 and 600 eggs per pound of body weight in one spawning event. They're laid in a nest called a red, and they're externally fertilized by male salmon later on. During development, you can see that black dot in the middle of each of the eggs, and those are actually their eyes. So the membranes of the eggs are, are slightly transparent, so you can actually watch them develop uh, in your classroom hatchery tanks. And this is what gives them the term eyed eggs. And here you can see several Atlantic salmon that are undergoing the changes between egg into elven. So some of these guys have started to hatch. And in this video, you can see the heartbeat of the salmon here. So his egg membrane is transparent. So you can see through it, you can start to see his internal organs develop as well as his spine here. And you can see that they're starting to move quite a bit more. So you can see the tail starting to move. You can see their eyes, so this is their head. And they'll start to move more and they'll stay in these cells until they're fully finished in the alevin stage. In the alevin stage, again, there's that yolk sac. So they're actually going to be feeding off of this yolk sac. They're not eating any solid food right now. And in the stream, they'd be hiding under the gravel and just kind of hanging out there, hiding from predators until they transition into the fry stage. And they stay there for about three to four weeks. So they don't need to search for their food at all. And they're still living in the stream. In the fry stage, so after those three to four weeks, you can see that they no longer have those yolk sacs on their stomachs, which means that they have to start looking or foraging for their own food. And they eat small aquatic insects and diatoms at this stage. They're still living in the stream, but they're moving uh, out of the gravel at this point, and they're kind of on their own, finding their own way through the streams. And then they enter the par stage. 
So again, at this stage, remember, they have gained these lateral dark lines called par marks. The par marks help the salmon to blend in to the stream habitat, including the stones and the algae and the aquatic vegetation that is in the streams so that they can continue to hide from predators while they're growing, because at this point, they're still not very big. And then again, you can see the big difference in appearance that they go through between the par and the smolt stage. And again, that process is called smoltification. And they do this because they're getting ready to transition into lake habitat. So they don't need to blend in with the stream habitat anymore because they're going to be living in the lakes. So now they're a blue gray color and they're slightly larger. They're actually twice as big as they were in the par stage. So now after going through this multiplication process and developing into adults, they're fully grown and they stay in the lake for about five years. When they're ready, they begin their journey back to the streams where they were born. And they do this through uh, the use of their olfactory sensory organs or their noses to smell their way back to the stream where they were born. And then this is where they lay their own eggs. And this is how the cycle repeats itself. So while they're spawning, so moving all the way from the lake back through the streams up to where they were born, they actually don't eat anything at all. And they live off of the fat reserves that they have stored throughout their time in the lakes. So I'd just like to take a moment to show you guys uh, some footage that we got this year when we were doing our in-stream egg incubation experiments. So we have the exact same type of Atlantic salmon eggs that you have in your classroom hatcheries inside this tube. This tube is made of PVC pipe with lids on both sides. We've drilled holes into the pipe and covered it with screen. And on the inside, there's river rock and we have funneled the eggs in there we secure them into the stream by digging out a nice little hole and covering it up with rocks. And then once we finished uh, watching the demonstration on how we do the in-stream work, I'm going to take a second just to compare uh, what we've done in the stream to what's happening in your tanks. And I think you'll be surprised to know that, that it's a very similar process to what you're experiencing uh, with the development of the eggs in your own tanks. As you guys can see right now, we did this in February, and this is because the eggs would be in the stream right now after being laid in the fall, and they actually do well in really cold water. We put 200 eggs into each of these tubes, and you can see we're very, very slowly washing them into the funnel. And the entire time that this is happening, that tube is submerged in the water because we don't want the eggs to be exposed to the air for too long. So we're making sure that the lid is on nice and tight because we don't want anyone falling out. And then we line them up perpendicular to the flow of the water. And we do this so that the water can flow through the tube and it oxygenates the water. And this brings oxygen to the eggs and it assists their development. And the screening around the tubes prevents predators from getting in and eating the eggs and also prevents the eggs from washing out. And then after they've had some time to develop into the fry stage, we're going to go back and we're going to open up these tubes. We're going to count how many fry uh, survived. And then that's the conclusion of our experiment for that year. So how does this compare to your classroom tanks? Well, just like your classroom tank, the eggs are being protected in our in-stream incubation tubes uh, the same way that they are in those fish condos on the left-hand side. So for anyone who hasn't hosted a tank themselves, this is a, a an example of the fish condos that the eggs stay in. So you can see those orange eyed eggs in there. 
They're all separated and they're all completely submerged underwater. The water has to be clear, clean, and cold, which means that in order to achieve that in your tanks, you need a filter, a chiller, and a bubbler. And then by insulating your tank with styrofoam and using a chiller, you can mimic the frosty stream that we put our eggs into. Because remember, Atlantic salmon eggs in the, in the wild hatch around April or May. So they love developing in cold, cold water. So it's very important that you make sure that the chiller is always running in the classroom hatchery tanks. So you can see that the process is very similar to what they would be doing in the, in the wild, where they would start as eggs move into the alevin stage and then in the fry stage we'll go into the stream and we'll release them so they can start foraging for their own food which is when you would take the fish out of your classroom hatchery tanks and put them in the streams yourselves that concludes my presentation on the atlantic salmon life cycle thank you guys so much for watching i hope you're enjoying the web series so far i'm looking forward to seeing the rest of the videos and i hope you guys learned something new today Thanks so much for watching. Bye. Excellent presentation. Thank you for that, Ashley. Now we're going to add a new segment to our program called Fishy Facts, where Johnny Nene is going to teach us about another species of fish or some general fish biology. What do you have for us this week, Johnny? Thanks so much, Ben, and welcome everybody. I'm Johnny Nene, and I'm the OFAH Fitzsimmons Financial Group Fish and Wildlife Conservation Intern, and I'll be your host through a series of segments called Fishy Facts. During these episodes, I'll be giving you guys a scoop on some cool native, invasive, and exotic fish species from around the world. Together, we'll investigate their life histories and unique adaptations that illustrate the incredible diversity of fish. And to kick things off, I've got something special for you guys this week. We're going to talk about an ancient fish from our own backyard, the lake sturgeon. Let's take a look. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about lake sturgeon. Lake sturgeon are Ontario's largest and longest living freshwater fish. They're ancient and they've remained largely unchanged for 200 million years. And they're huge. They can reach lengths of 2.2 meters and weigh over 240 pounds. That's heavier than the average NFL linebacker. They can also reach ages of over 150 years old. But what do they look like? Let's take a look. Here we have a replica of a lake sturgeon. As you can see, they have torpedo shaped bodies with elongated snouts that have four barbels underneath on the ventral side. Their heads are bony, but their internal skeletons are made mostly of cartilage, which is the same stuff that our noses are made out of. They also have five rows of bony plates that run along their body called scutes, which slowly disappear as the fish grow older. Young lake sturgeon can be gray or brown to greenish gray in color and have varying degrees of black splotches that slowly disappear once they reach about 60 centimeters in length. Adults, as you can see, are gray or olive brown with white bellies. Lake sturgeon live in cool waters at the bottom of deep lakes, rivers, and streams. They prefer sandy or silty substrates but have also been found over gravel and cobble. They're bottom feeders, and they use the barbels under their snout to help them detect their prey items, which can consist of worms or leeches, aquatic insect larvae, mollusks, crayfish, or other small organisms. They lack teeth, so they use their extendable lips to suck up their prey items as they're cruising along the bottoms. And lake sturgeon take a very long time to reach maturity. Males aren't ready to spawn until they're about 20 years of age, and females not until they're about 25 years of age. Once reaching maturity, a female may only spawn once every four to six years, and they'll travel up to 400 kilometers to their spawning grounds, which are in fast-flowing streams. 
Depending on their age and size, a female may lay up to half a million eggs at one time. The eggs are deposited over top of rocks and logs to which they adhere. Now let's talk a little bit about the history of lake sturgeon in Ontario. Lake sturgeon were once prolific across all the Great Lakes. However, intense commercial fishing between the mid-1800s and early 1900s took a massive toll on their population. Prior to 1860, lake sturgeon were considered a nuisance species that destroyed fishing gear that was intended for more valuable fish species. Lake sturgeon that were caught incidentally at the time would be thrown on shore to dry, then burned as fuel for steam engines, fed to pigs, or buried to be used as fertilizer. However, the value of their flesh and caviar, or eggs, was soon realized, and the harvest for lake sturgeon grew immensely. In just 10 years, between 1885 and 1895, over 5 million pounds of lake sturgeon were harvested just in Lake Erie alone. But by the final year of that 10-year window, the catch rates had dropped by over 80%. And it is because of this intense commercial harvest, along with their very slow reproduction, that many populations have yet to recover. And there are currently three populations that are listed as at risk in Ontario. Well, I hope you guys have enjoyed learning about the lake sturgeon as much as I've enjoyed sharing with you. So please be sure to tune in next time where I'll have some more cool and exciting fishy facts. Thanks guys, we'll see you next time. Great, thank you Johnny. Well, that concludes week four of our Bring Back the Salmon classroom hatchery program. There's another activity on our website, bringbackthesalmon.ca. If you're watching our program through YouTube and you like our videos, please click the like button and subscribe to the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program YouTube channel. Next week, we're going to be learning about aquatic ecosystems and the habitat requirements for Atlantic salmon from the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program habitat technician, Brian Morrison.